buying a yacht is the dream of many and it's more achievable than you may think. Wealthy people are often very busy people though and it may be that they simply don't have the time to do the research to understand the process of buying and then of owning a yacht. Which is a shame because a yacht is an asset that can bring so much happiness and help you to form so many wonderful memories that actually if you are that busy it's probably exactly what you need. In this series of videos I'll be showing you the three simple steps that are necessary to become a yacht owner. I'll be looking at a different yacht each month and I'll be posing as a different buyer each month so no matter what yacht you are interested in, no matter what your personal circumstances are, you should be able to find invaluable tips and insights. In this particular episode, I'll be taking the role of a buyer from the United States who wants to keep his yacht in the Mediterranean until the end of the summer season and then ship her back to Miami. The yacht that I have my eye on is a Ferretti 960 called My Su 2. So I came to Venice to take a look at her and I was shown around by the broker. A very nice fellow indeed. So, having decided that I want to buy this yacht, what are those three steps that I need to take? Step number one is most certainly to get the legal side of things in order. The Mediterranean Yacht Brokers Association, also known as MEBA, have published a very thorough, tried and tested memorandum of agreement that's formed the contract for thousands of yacht sales worldwide. This particular contract allows for you to pay a 10% deposit for the yacht, after which you can see trial and survey the vessel. The sea trial would usually come first, and if there's anything at all that you don't like about the yacht, you can get your deposit back with only the expense of the sea trial being withheld. You have to make that decision to accept or reject the yacht pretty quickly, within 24 hours of the sea trial. Assuming that you're happy with the yacht's performance, you now pass to the next step of surveying the yacht, and you'll need a qualified yacht surveyor to do that for you. More about that in a moment, but suffice to say that after the yacht has been surveyed, you have seven days to accept or reject the yacht. This time, however, there has to be something pretty serious found on the survey for you to walk away from the deal. Little matters that can be easily fixed are just not enough. My strong advice on the legal aspects of your yacht purchase is to hire a good, specialised marine lawyer to help you through the process. And here are the reasons why. They can draft and prepare all of the documents necessary that will give you free title to the yacht. They can advise you on the best legally binding ownership structure for your personal circumstances, whether that is to own the yacht as an individual or as a company. They can ensure that the crucial moment when the money leaves your hands and you receive title to the yacht proceeds in a smooth manner. This is an important matter when you consider that your funds will be leaving a bank account in one country, arriving in the account of another country, and the yacht is probably going to be in another country still. In my hypothetical case of an American citizen buying a yacht to take back to the United States, I really want to know about any tax I may need to pay when it gets there. And I'll probably base my decision on exactly where to keep the yacht on the basis of that advice. The legal aspects of buying a yacht are possibly the most complex aspects. And it surprises me how often I hear even successful yacht owners relying on the advice of some friend who once owned a yacht. 
laws change continually and marine law can be complex due to the amount of countries that it can encompass. Being complex doesn't mean it has to complicate your life though, if you just hire a competent marine lawyer. Step number two, there are a certain amount of logistics involved with buying and then with owning a yacht. But once again, the key to getting the logistics right is quite simply finding the right people to help you. You will certainly need a marine surveyor to be on board the yacht during the sea trial and also to take a good look at the overall condition of the yacht. This usually includes even lifting the vessel in a shipyard and having a look at the bottom of the hull. Surveyors offer a wide variety of services. The list of all their tests and examinations is too long to write here, but they include a structural inspection of the hull and superstructure, inspection of onboard machinery, tests on steering systems, stabilizers and other systems on board, tests of deck hardware, operational tests of the electrical systems, inspecting the interior fit out. And I should also mention that since MySu2 has MTU engines, the surveyor will arrange for an MTU technician to be on board to take a good look at those engines. MTU, by the way, have incredible records covering the service history of each one of their engines. When purchasing a yacht, the surveyor will be a one-off cost that's worth its weight in gold. And by the way, we'll see how much gold just a little later. But I'm not expecting my surveyor to come back with a completely clean bill of health, not even for my Su2 or for any other yacht for that matter. All yachts are a work in progress. The important thing is that the surveyor will be able to tell me if there's anything I should be really alarmed about and that gives me reason to reject the yacht. That's something highly unlikely with a yacht as new and as well looked after as my Su2. And talking of work in progress, here is the man that will be responsible for taking over the task of maintaining and caring for my new yacht, the captain, also known as the master of the vessel, and rightly so, since maritime law places considerable responsibilities on his shoulders. If I were really buying my suit too, I would take a little time to interview a few captains to make sure that I find one that not only has relevant experience, but also has a personality that I feel comfortable being around with friends and family on my vacation. In my case, he'll need to be confident enough to take delivery of the yacht in Venice, cruise Croatia, and then oversee shipping the yacht back to Miami and taking delivery of it when it arrives. Choosing a good captain is as important as choosing a good yacht. And in the final part of the video covering the financial aspects of yacht purchase, I'll tell you what I would be prepared to pay for one. I think it goes without saying that if you're going to buy a yacht, then you've already decided that some of your wealth needs to be reinvested into something that will bring you personal rewards rather than financial rewards. But how much does it cost to buy a yacht like my Su2? And after that, how much does it cost to run her? First of all, let's take a look at the most obvious cost, which is the purchase price of the yacht itself. My Su2 is for sale at a price of €4,250,000. And for the purpose of this video, we'll say that I pay the full price. As I'm sure you know, usually the sales price can be negotiated. Added to that, I have the cost of a good marine lawyer. Now I spoke to a law firm who I know very well and I asked them for an indication of fees to cover the contract, conveyancing of documents, setting up an ownership structure, tax advice, ensuring that the yacht has clean title, really everything I need. And the estimated cost is between €20,000 and 28,500. So I'm going for the higher of the two since I always budget for a worst case scenario. 
I also need to budget for a surveyor, of course, and I spoke to a yacht surveyor to get an idea of the cost of a thorough survey for Mysu 2 that covers examining and testing just about all of the most important systems and machinery. Now, he came in at €6,000, plus about €750 Euro for the engine technician, and then the travel and hotel expenses of about €140 Euro per day. So I'm going to budget that at about €7,000, which should be about right. He'll need to lift the yacht in a shipyard, of course, so I got a quote for lifting my Su-2 at a shipyard in Pesaro, which is not too far from Venice. And the quote came back at 2,800 euro, along with an offer of a daily mooring rate of just 60 euro per day. So that would be a great place to keep the yacht before I take delivery and start my cruise in Croatia. By the way, all of these companies so far have offered this information freely. So I'll credit them at the end of this video. The video does have a sponsor though, and I'm very grateful indeed to Private Insurance Services, who are making this series of vlogs possible, and also provided me with a very competitive quote of €41,380 as an annual insurance premium. The quote includes hull and machinery, the tender, towing and assistance, medical expenses, and a few other matters that I look forward to covering in future videos. So, my total cost of purchase, on top of the 4.25 million purchase price, comes to 79,680 euro. More than half of that is the insurance though, which is actually a yearly running cost anyway. And talking of yearly running costs, as you'll know if you've seen my video on the subject, about half of a yacht's yearly running costs are usually in the form of crew wages. So let's have a look at that. As I mentioned, the value of a good captain really just can't be overestimated. So I'd be inclined to pay well for a good captain with engineering experience too. I would expect to pay him about 9,000 euro per month. A chief stewardess on board would likely cost 3,500 euro per month. A second stew, about 3,000. And a deckhand, 2,000 euro per month. With regards to berthing costs, I've not taken into consideration berths in Croatia, since I'll only be using the yacht there for a short time, and to be honest, I shall anchor out most of the time. And as you probably know, many people keep their yacht outside their house in Fort Lauderdale, but I don't want to opt out of berth costs that easily, so I am budgeting a cost of €6,000 per month for the berth, plus €2,000 per month for power. That makes a total of €96,000 per annum. To cover regular services of machinery, crew uniforms, cleaning equipment, and all those other things that the new captain will be responsible for looking after, I'm budgeting €15,000 per month on average. Now at this point I really should state that this budget is pretty generous. I may not need all of the crew all of the year. I may not need to pay berth costs if I keep the yacht behind my house and anchor out quite often, but I prefer to give you a worst case scenario kind of budget rather than painting a picture that's just too rosy for reality. So my yearly running costs should be at the most 210,000 for crew wages, 96,000 for berth costs, 41,380 for insurance, and 180,000 for maintenance services and materials, giving a grand total of 527,380 euro per year. I published a video about one year ago about the running costs of a yacht, and afterwards I was swamped with complaints from people who wanted to know about the fuel costs. The reason that I didn't mention the fuel costs, actually two reasons, are firstly that fuel costs vary enormously from one country to another, but secondly, of course, the fuel costs depend entirely upon how much you use the yacht. However, for this yacht, for my Su-2, I got hold of the fuel table of the vessel, and I can tell you that at slow speeds of 11.8 knots, that's the kind of speed that you'll ask the captain to do if he's taking the yacht from one place to another, 
she consumes 9.7 litres per mile. If you want to go faster when you're with your friends on board the yacht, let's say 23.5 knots, she consumes 25 litres per mile. It's true that buying a yacht is not as straightforward as buying a car or a house. There are considerations of what flag to fly, where to keep it, and of course, the running costs as well. It doesn't have to be that complicated either though, if you're prepared to follow those three steps that we discussed. Legal matters. Get a specialized marine lawyer to ensure that whoever you buy the yacht from, whatever flag they're flying, you have clean ownership and an ownership structure that suits your personal circumstances. Logistics. Get a good marine surveyor to ensure that the yacht is safe, seaworthy and in good working order. And especially get a good captain who with time you'll develop a relationship of trust with to be sure that the yacht is being well maintained and run correctly. Financial. Be aware of the costs of purchase and also the running costs of the yacht. And quite frankly, these have little to do with the running costs of the previous owner, since only you know how you want to run your yacht in the future. As a yacht broker, I sometimes hear fellow brokers offering legal advice to clients or making observations about technical aspects of a yacht. I've even heard some brokers critiquing the way that a yacht is built when they're talking to the yacht builder. In my opinion, for a smooth transaction to take place, everybody should respect the roles of the others. So legal advice should be given by a qualified marine lawyer. Technical observations should be the domain of a qualified marine surveyor. And a captain should be left to select his crew and to care for the running and the maintenance of the yacht. The broker's job, having found you the yacht that you want to buy, is to bring all of those relevant experts together so that they can do their job and you can do yours, which is to turn up on the dock with your suitcases and your friends ready to make some really memorable experiences. In next month's video, I'll be taking a look at a different yacht, represented by a different broker and with a buyer with totally different circumstances. You won't want to miss out on that, I'm sure, along with all of the other unique yacht-based content found only on Yachts for Sale channel. Yeah.